Paul came out of a, a religious background of monotheism and was sent to the Gentile world of polytheism and got quite a shock, I suppose. And over the course of time, writing to Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians or Philema, all that type of thing, uh, back and forth, uh, Paul put down into the book of Ephesians what I consider to be the seven key doctrines that separate the Christian church from the religions of the world. And we've been taking each one of those each week and study them. Uh, so here's where we are. We're in the fifth doctrine called one faith. That's kind of interesting uh, that he calls this one faith. And so what we're going to talk about after a word of prayer are five aspects of this fifth, fifth doctrine called the one faith. The one faith. I don't know if that strikes you as odd. One faith. Not two, not three, not four. Called it one. Use the word, Greek word heis. Called it one. One pistos. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this study and pull this thing apart and try to understand what he meant so that we can walk away with one faith. Let's pray. Give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The privilege to confess sin. The reason that's important is the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It separates you from the great ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the fellowship with the Father through the Holy Spirit. Confession of sin removes that inner barrier of carnality. Through 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue as three examples. The believer priest out of 1 Peter 2 should confess his sins in order to study the word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit who teaches and recalls. John 14, 26. I give you that moment. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet today to study with us the seven great doctrines that separate the Christian church in the world from world religions. We study today what Paul called the one faith. The one faith is what separates us, just like the one body, the one spirit, etc. We're in the fifth in a series of seven that Paul listed. And I pray we would have clarity on this subject matter today. Before, for it is a key doctrine. And so we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls and our souls to the truth to the world in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you were like me, you grew up in a non-religious climate. I didn't have to become a Christian to understand faith. Faith was something that my family talked about a great deal. As farmers, we understood faith. As business people, they understand faith. Faith is not just a religious word. The non-religious world talk about faith just like they talk about love, just like they talk about mercy and compassion. 
And so the question would be, what separates that? Well, let me tell you a few things. Even though the term faith is used by the non-religious community, it's used by the religious community, and it's used by the church of Jesus Christ completely different. He says this is the one faith that is different. And so we're going to talk about that point number one. Faith is not an exclusive term to Christianity. In fact, is it a common term? It is a common term in the non-religious world as well as the religious world. It is a common term. If you was to study any of the world religions, you would find the word faith would be a major doctrine. If you went and lived among the non-religious community, you would find that faith was an important doctrine as far as a term. So let me talk about common principle. Here is the common principle among all of them. Here's a common principle. Faith must have a reliable working object. Anybody that has faith believes that. It don't matter if it's a non-religious, religious, or Christian. They all have one thing as far as a common principle. The common principle of faith is that Okay? Now, in the non-religious world, it refers to an, an alliance or an allegiance to duty and fidelity to what one promises. My grandfather, when I was a little boy, we would go to the bank once a year for seed money. One local bank, one banker. My grandfather would walk in, and the banker would call him by his first name, Guy, and he would call him by his first name. And a deal would be done. He would ask my grandfather what he needed this year. My grandfather would tell him. They would shake hands, and it was over. And when the season was over, the harvest season was over, the first thing we did is make a trip to the bank and pay him. That whole enterprise system was based on faith. An allegiance of personal duty and fidelity to what one promises. Of course, that was America in the 40s and 50s. But in the community on which I lived, that's the way all business was done. Faith. Fidelity of what one promised. And so there is a common principle. Faith must have a reliable working object. The question is faith in what and why? Faith in what and why? you will find that it is always the reliability of the working object that builds confidence and trust in the one's faith. Let me give you a common example. Here's a common example. If your chair at home is reliable, and the chair at school is reliable, and the chair at church is reliable, and the chair at work is reliable. It builds confidence and trust in chairs. However, if you sat in a chair that was problematic, you would lose confidence and trust or faith in chairs or specific kinds of chairs. Common sense principle. Now, certainly you know that. <laughs> yeah. So here's a common principle. 
no matter where you find faith, here's a common principle. Therefore, the value of your faith, the value you place on your faith, the value of your faith, the value of your faith lies in the object, not the subject. No matter how you believe, if that chair keeps falling and hurting you, you change your faith idea about chairs or specific chairs. Your value on the one hand of the reliability of the object is very important to how you determine what you're going to trust or rely on. That's the one thing faith has across the board. It doesn't matter if it's an unreligious, it doesn't matter if it's religious, it doesn't matter if it's Christianity. The other thing that's important for you to understand about faith is that in the bigger picture, there are two spheres of faith. Two spheres of operation, faith, how faith operates. There's two spheres. There's the dinosphere of the cosmic system, the world way, the world views and the way the world deals with stuff. We call it cosmos diabolicus. And the reason we do is because in John, the 12th chapter and the book of John, deals with it, it says the God of this world, referring to Satan, controls the way people view and think things out, how they process their thinking. First John 5.19, John picks that subject back up. The book of Revelation is about the war between God and Satan. The first book, Genesis, and the last book, Revelation, is about that war and everything else in between it. So this is really important. By now you realize I'm at point two. There are two spheres. There's the cosmic system. That's just the Greek word for world. The dinosphere of cosmos, where diabolicus is taught. The, de the devil's system of way you view things. And there is the divine system, the dinosphere of God, the dinosphere of divine thinking. So over here in Satan's, the cosmos system, we call it cosmos diabolicus. It's a viewpoint of life based on world away from God. On the di di divine dinosphere, Everything is based on the character of God and the word of God. Everything. Everything. Over here, everything's based on what Satan's pushing. Over here is everything God's pushing. What you, how you believe, how you view life, how you view everything over here, same over here. This one's run by God and the word of God. This one's run over here by Satan, a disguised system of sin and evil. A disguised system. He appears like an angel of light in order to teach darkness. God is light and teaches light. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 gives you that example of those two dinospheres. The cosmic system, dinosphere, and the divine system. 1 John 2.4. These two dinospheres are really important. Now, in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 7, Paul says this. Now, you know this. He says, walk by faith, not by sight. These two systems, Satan's system runs by sight. God's system runs by faith. You understand that? The question is sight and what? 
Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father. And they mean by that, touch, feel, experience, like we do in the world. I'm not going to believe the Bible unless I see the Bible. I want to see the Bible. Show us the Father, and it, would, it, it will satisfy us. The Jews wanted him to do the same thing. His disciples wanted him to do it. The Jews wanted to do it in order to believe. You know what he told them both? If you have seen me, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And if you're having difficult believing that, then believe the Father's works that I do if you've got to see something. Because they will explain to you that the Father has sent me to do his work. And so he would perform miracles in their presence, and they still wouldn't believe because it's about the source. It's, it's the value of it. If you'll show me, it'll satisfy me. He showed them over and over and over, and they still didn't believe. Because it has to be value in it. They, it wasn't the reliability. They threw that away. And they held to a value that they threw away. And we call that negative volition. That turns into reversionism and build scar tissue on the soul so that you, you couldn't show them anything they would believe because they're in darkness, not light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and people remain to stay in darkness. And so it's important that we understand some basic principles. Thomas one of the hand-picked disciples of Christ, Thomas. Thomas was told by the disciples themselves, excitingly, that they had seen and talked with a risen Lord Jesus Christ. Ten disciples came and told Thomas, we have witnessed and they were excited. We have witnessed the presence of a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to what Thomas said. Thomas said to them, unless I see, I will not believe. Unless I see. And it wasn't just enough unless I see, Thomas said, unless I see the nail scars and see the puncture of his side, the wound of his side, I will not believe. Just think of that. Just think if Jesus in his resurrection body had been healed of those things, Thomas would not have believed. He put restrictions on it. It was not enough for Thomas that Christ said, on the third day, I will rise from the dead. It was not enough for Thomas to hear the enemies of Christ say to the court system, the liar called Jesus Christ has said that he would be raised from the dead three days after he died. Secure the tomb because the second lie will be, first, will be worse than the first.
Thomas was not going to believe in a resurrected Christ unless he could see the nail scars in his hand and his side with a wound on it. The resurrection of Christ was not enough for Thomas. Jesus referred to him as unbelieving. You are unbelieving. You will See, here's the point. You'll never have faith unless you have believing. When you have believing, you have faith. When you have no be believing, when you're unbelieving, you have no faith. And his faith wasn't based on the word of God. It was on evidence, visual evidence of a resurrected person. Visible evidence. Now think of his request. Oh, ye of little faith. Huh? Oh, ye of little faith. He wanted physical evidence out of a resurrected body that it had died. It required Christ to show up and give him the evidence because that wasn't part of the evidence that he was raised from the dead. Part of the evidence that he was raised from the dead was on the third day he would come out of the grave. Your faith can get kind of tricky whether you know what I mean. Well, unless I see. Do you know how many people say that? Do you know how many Christians live by that motto? Unless I see, I will not believe. Do you know how many people live by that? You know how you'll see? Listen to me. Ephesians 1.18 is how you will see is Ephesians 1.18. You will see with the eyes of your soul or you will not see at all the spiritual things of God. The natural man in 1 Corinthians 2.14 cannot perceive, cannot comprehend, cannot appraise the spiritual things. I will not believe unless I see. Unless I see, I will not believe. That's not the way faith works. I have faith so that I can see. I have faith that I can see the things of God. Listen to this, Hebrews 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Here's what you're missing. At the very top of your paper, will you write, th write this down? Yeah, I want to show you something. It's important. Write the word, word of God. Just write that down. This, this exercise is important. Could be a gate question. Now, I want you to do something. Circle the word God and circle the word word. Word of, don't circle that, of God. Circle those two words. Word and God. Circle them. Did you do that? Please do that. I wouldn't ask you to do it if I didn't think it was important. You've got to be able to see something by faith. Now watch. Take a line and draw it down so that it forms a V. One line from the word faith and one line from the word God and draw it down so it becomes a V. Are you with me? Under that V, write the word faith. Because listen to what this is. This is Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Two things are really important for faith to work. One is the word, the word of God. 
On the one hand, your reliability is to understand what the word says because whatever the word says, God honors by doing it. You understand that? So you got the word faith underneath that V. That's faith. And here's a, here a Bible verse for you with it. Now, you, you put Romans 10 to 17, didn't you? But here's another one, Romans 4.21. Because Romans 4.21 says, what God has promised, the word, what God has promised in his word, he is faithful to perform. God is faithful. God is able and faithful to perform. So you got to have both of those hooked up in your faith-based system. Both those things are vitally important for your ba faith base. The Word of God and the character of God is what makes the faith of the Christian off the Word of God and the character of God work in his life. It's that connection of two things. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, and we walk by faith, not by sight. That's how the one faith system works. You have to be in the you have to you have you have to be in the kingdom of the divine Son. You have to be in the kingdom of God, like Colossians 1 13, Acts 26 18. Through the gospel of Christ, he transfers you from the world of darkness into the world of light. The word of God is called light. We're called children of light. Jesus is the light. God is light. In him there is no darkness. Faith is not just about God. It's about the word of God. The word of God. It requires both for the Christian faith to work. It's got to be the word from the Bible, the word. Faith comes by hearing the word of God and the character of God that promises to do what he says. Your reliability on it working every time is your faith in the character of God, the essence of God. The essence of God, we talk about it around here all the time, the ten characteristics, and that's just the primary colors. That's not secondary colors of, of, of God. It's just the primaries. You get to secondaries like mercy and grace and all that, that's phenomenal. Jesus told Thomas, you got to stop unbelieving and start believing. And this is how it works. It works the word of God. Got to have them both. Can't have one out the other. That's what makes the Christian faith uniquely different. Bible, Christian Bible, completed And the character of God that stands behind his promises. When David was faith in Goliath, the wonderful story in the Bible, we all know it. Taken out of 1 Samuel 17. But sometimes we miss some of the important features that God shines his light on in spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. The fight between David and Goliath was a spiritual warfare fight. So I wrote down a few verses that I think is really important that I think God spotlights on in spiritual warfare that we could learn from David fighting Goliath. Now, listen, everybody in the whole world, once they hear the story of David and Goliath, quote it. <laughs> When we're fighting something where the odds are so against us, they call it fighting Goliath. Las Vegas would have never put any money on David. 
<laughs> and we'd have got stinking rich by betting with him. Right? Talking about a lottery. I'm putting my money on David. He killed a lion and a bear and has the confidence he'll kill him because he understands God likes odds like that. Truth of the matter is, we'd have put no money. In. We'd have put no money on David. About like Auburn football yesterday. After the first half, you wouldn't put any money on him. You could have got stinking rich. Put no money on him. I mean, the odds, boy, what? They'd have been glad to take your money yesterday at halftime. So I wrote a few verses down for you that I think he spotlighted. For example, in verse 16, Goliath came out every day, defied the God of Israel and the army, and taunted them, listen to me, for 40 days. He came out every day and blasphemed their God, their army, and everything about him for 40 days. For 40 days, we had to listen to all the media cover it. And Vegas putting odds. Nobody giving him a dog's chance. This nine-foot man stands out with his armor and all of his decorations of the world on him. In the bright of the sun of the day, when it glistened off from his armor and would blind you, came out every day, send me somebody, send me somebody from your great God and army to fight me, winner take all. 40 days. David shows up towards the end of this. When he comes out and beats his chest and screams out, you bunch of cowards, your God is a coward, you're a coward, your army's a coward. Is there no one in Israel that can fight Goliath? <laughs> David, the little shepherd boy with his sack lunch, was appalled. Who is this person that dare defy God and the army of Israel? Who is this guy? His brother said, you better shut up. You don't know anything about war, and you don't know anything about anything. He said, well, I know something. You don't talk about my God that way. Well, shut up and go back home then. This is no place for you anyhow. Listen, it was the right place for him. It was the wrong place for them. They had no battle courage. They had no faith. They lost their faith when the man walked out and the sun shined on his armor and he was nine feet tall and he had all of these victories listed all about him. He took a small army just to carry his weapons. that he used. Who are you putting your money on? <laughs> Who are you putting your money on? In verse 36 and 37, David is overwhelmed by his blasphemy against God. And David only knows this. Listen to what he, David, this is all David knows. The battle is always the Lord's. I saw him kill a lion. I saw him kill a bear. The battle is always the Lord's. Goliath is no different than that. It don't matter. I'm not impressed by anything.
David steps out and asks him to surrender. <laughs> this little scrawny nosed teenager stepped out and asked him to surrender. Well, he still had the opportunity. <laughs> He said, is this a joke? Goliath says, is this a joke? Is this all Israel has got to send a baby, a, a, a boy to do a man's job? Is this what Israel is? Send a boy to do a man's job? I represent the world. Who does he represent? You send me a boy to do a man's job? He looked at David and said, son, you need to go home. If you challenge me anymore, I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. <laughs> David said, this will be the last day your mouth will open against God. This is the last day. You better have a good day of boasting because this is the last day you're ever going to do this. Because the God of Israel, the Lord of the battle, will bring victory today. And since you, it's your request, we're going to let the birds of the air and the beasts of the field eat you. Since it's your request. There will be no honorable burial for you. Let me tell you, the odds were, listen, Vegas was still running big odds against him. <laughs> God is so wonderful. David, Goliath says to him, what are you going to fight me with? Words? <laughs> What's he going to fight me with? Words? No, I'll tell you, David says, I'm going to fight you with the word. I didn't come out here to jaw you. I come to shut your jaws. I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of all Israel and the only God of the world. And this is going to be the worst day of your life, Goliath. I promise you, this will be the worst day of your life. Where's confidence come like that? Where's his faith? You think it's, you think it's anywhere other than the Lord? The battle is the Lord's. All I got to do is give it to him. There's where it takes faith. Faith to give the battle to the Lord when Goliath thinks he's bigger than the Lord. And all of Israel believes it. And David is the only one. <laughs> he says to him, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would dare taunt and blaspheme the God of Israel? Hey, God. I mean, you don't call people to their face like that. It's uncircumcised Philistine. Well, he gave, him, he gave him no credit for anything other than being alive. <laughs> I come to you. I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. It is enough. When is, it, when is he enough for you? You're always telling, well, if you don't prove to me, if I don't see this, then I, it's not sufficient. When are you going to stop that? When are you going to stop that? Why don't you read that story and put your life in David's shoes? Why don't you read that? And then when you put your life in those shoes, how about putting them in your, in your real life? Because <laughs> you know how that story turns out. The Christian's faith. Point three, 
the Christian's faith is established on the source of the character of the Godhead and the Word of God. Listen. <laughs> when you go to fight the enemy today, by faith, you have three members of the Godhead. Three members of the Godhead are out there fighting on your behalf. Think about that. All three members of the Godhead. We know all of this. For example, Ephesians 4th chapter 4 through 6, we have one, one Spirit, one Lord, and one God the Father. Out of the six, out of the, the seven doctrines, three of them are the Godhead. Individually, individually working on your behalf. When we come to 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, and we're talking about the body of Christ, and we're talking about spiritual gifts, we have all three members of the Godhead working on our behalf. We have the Spirit who is distrib distributing spiritual gifts. We have the Lord who is distributing the ministries of the gift. And there is God who is working the performance of it according to the eternal plan of God. <laughs> Holy catfish, people. You have all three members of the Godhead working on your behalf on every situation. We live in this type of a dispensation. For example, in the Godhead, you have all three members in effective prayer life. Your effective prayer life is based on these three working in unison on behalf of your request. For example, you address all your prayers to the Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the Word of God. I put all those scriptures down for you. You want an effective prayer life? You've got to engage all three members of the Godhead in it. And when you do, shaboom, it's done. Effective, the effective or effectual prayer of a righteous man is based on the word of God working all three members of the Godhead in unison on your prayer request. Think about that. Listen to Jude 20. Listen to Jude 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy Faith. How do you do that? Write this down. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. You inhale, exhale the word of God towards the character of God. You inhale, exhale. That's the faith cycle. You inhale, exhale. And God begins through the Godhead, the entire Godhead gets operative immediately on behalf of that. We live in one of the most unique dispensations you could have ever imagined to live in. We live in when all three members of the Godhead are engaged in your life all the time. Why do you walk around defeated? You, you look like the army of Israel who doesn't know how to battle victoriously. You're carrying way too much self-armor and not enough divine armor. David didn't fight Goliath in his own ability. He fought it in the name of the Lord God Almighty. He knew how to engage him. Building up faith in the Christian life is, comes from cycling categorical doctrine. We call it the faith cycle based on inhale, exhale. There's an inhale side to it. There's an exhale side to it. We call it hearing, going to believing, going to applying, going to completing. That's an inhale, exhale. You know this if you're a member of this church. Now, whether you do it or not, I don't know. You might be like the brothers of David who talk it and can't walk it. Or you'd be like David who walks it and very seldom talks it. Until he engages somebody in it, then he talks like crazy. He can't stop him. Now, 
Noah and the ark. I picked out another story for you. Noah and the ark. When you read Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 8, Noah and the ark. God told Noah why to build an ark. Did you know that? He told him why to build an ark. He said, the world is corrupt, and we're going to destroy it. The world has gone corrupt. The world has gone corrupt. They're evil. The w world is filled with the violence of evil. And I'm going to bring a closure to it. That's 6th chapter, first 13 verses, by the way. Then God told him how to build the ark. Because Noah had no idea what kind of a flood was going to come with water because they didn't have any. They had no idea the amount of rain and storm that they were going to get. They never had it. No, nobody fished in a boat. God told Noah who would be saved from judgment. He said, I'm going to bring judgment on the world. So Noah began to preach the message of God's righteousness through Christ. The only way out of the judgment of the world is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come to the Father except through him. So he began to preach it. For 120 years, he preached it. The only way into the boat, your ticket's been paid. Get aboard. Your ticket's been paid. Get aboard. All aboard. Listen, 120 years of preaching, the only people converted was his own family. And he was happy for that. 120 years. At least you get disappointed. 120 years. Got this great big boat called the Ark. 100, listen, what? Seven people plus him? He told Noah who would be saved from judgment. One way, one faith. One way, one faith. God told him what to preach to his generation. Preach the coming judgment and how to, a warning how to get out of it. And there are a lot of, a lot of passages that support that. Hebrews 11, 7, 1 Peter 3, 20, 2 Peter 2, 5, Genesis 6, 3, 120 years. The Bible says that he died at, at 950, 350 years after the flood. How important was the ark? How important was it to be in the ark? <laughs> Those who were in the ark had life after judgment. Now, I'm going to close this out. When I tell you that Christians are instructed to walk by faith and not by sight, out of 2 Corinthians 5, 7, what you miss is what's in verse 6 and verse 8. <laughs> See, we're always quoting, and I'm the world's advocate of 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith and not by sight. What we miss is the subject. What we miss is the subject. What's the subject? How you live in your body and how you live out of your body in the Lord. Right? Well, gosh, you got six and eight, right? That's, that's what we call the sandwich. <laughs> Life after death. This is what Paul was talking about in Romans 14, 6 through 8, when he talks in verse 8. He says, for me to live is Christ. 
If I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's Christ. Therefore, it's always about Christ. If I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's Christ. Therefore, it's all about Christ. I live for Christ. I die for Christ. Therefore, it's all about Christ. Please tell me you understand that, Romans 14, 8. This is his point. His point, God's faithfulness to our walk of faith on earth is our assurance that the alternative life to earth is heaven where we will walk by sight. Our walk by faith here is the assurance that we'll walk by sight there. Don't get them confused. Well, let's close. Let's close in a word of prayer. Men will take the offering. We'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back uh, to the Eucharist, and then we'll go home. <laughs> Here, there, or in the air. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for one faith a connection between the Word of God and God Almighty is where our faith finds victory in this life and the next. Encourage our hearts. Because our walk by faith on earth is the assurance that we will walk by sight in the next life in heaven. Encourage our hearts with one faith and what sets us apart from other types of faith. Take this offering today, Father, and may we be good stewards of it as people give honorably out of love for missions, for ministry, for the work of the Lord through this body of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.